I am so happy to be able to close down this conference. I have spent the last 26 years really focusing on what makes people happy at work and what makes communities and organizations thrive. And I will say you are a very happy environment. It's been wonderful to meet many of you. There aren't many conferences where you can walk up, hang out with people awkwardly, and have them turn around and say, it's so nice to meet you. Welcome. Tell me about yourself. So it just feels so good to be here with you. I do want to bring you in to maybe a little bit of a peek in the future, because as Sean was alluding to, I think I have a little bit of a gift for looking into the future. It might have come from my father, Louis Stewart. And I grew up in a town called San Anselmo. Does anybody know across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco? I see a hands raised, Marin County, FTW. In the late 60s, uh, when I was just a toddler, my dad decided to run for city council. And he became passionate about the problem of landfill and like how much trash was going into landfill. So he worked on this proposal and he was like, what would happen if we had households separate out cans and bottles and cardboard in separate bins and then put it out on the curb so that the, the garbage companies could pick it up and recycle that, that garbage, which seemed like a great idea. So he brought it back to the council <clears throat> and he was super excited about the proposal, and it was resoundingly shut down. And there was one council member that said, Lewis, do you really think that housewives are going to dig through the trash to separate it out? This is just a totally unfeasible kind of solution. But my dad was very persistent, and he kept going. And in 1971, San Anselmo was the first city in the state of California to have a curbside recycling program. So thank you, dad. <laughs> It turns out that housewives don't mind digging in the trash in order to save the planet. So he was a little bit ahead of his time. I think for me, some of my exploration and predicting the future came in 1996 when I left my corporate job to start a business. I was a management consultant in Silicon Valley. And for those of you who were around during that time, you remember it was super exciting and there was all this technology innovation. It was such a heady, exciting place to be. But it was kind of strange because as I was in that environment, I noticed that while you had these cool creative people who were talking about innovation and technology, you had a lot of the old school management structures. Anybody remember forced ranking? Do they still do that? Like forced ranking. Thank you, Jack Welsh. Just all of these things that didn't fit with this culture of innovation and technology. So I spent about 10 years working in companies, traveling the country, doing my very best to create programs and coach managers into really making a change in their corporate culture and leadership. And at the same time, a really funny thing would happen that sometimes when a leader would bring me in to do an event to help retain employees, uh, at the end of it, they would like pull me aside and they'd be like, excuse me, how did you quit your job to start a business? <laughs> and I was like, um, okay. Begin to notice more and more and more people in corporate jobs were curious about what it took to travel that path. So I became kind of fascinated by it. And after about 10 years, I decided to stop doing consulting and begin to work with people as a coach who wanted to make that transition. One day when I was pushing my son in a stroller around the neighborhood, I had this vision. Uh, if I imagine myself in front of an assembled group of executives, so it's a little bit meta right now. <laughs> and in my vision, I was thinking, if I could just say what has been on my mind for so many years as a management consultant, just to be extremely straight and say, if you do not change these leadership uh, trends, that you're going to lose your best and brightest employees. And so with passion, I came back, put my son to sleep, wrote a blog post, which I called an open letter to CEOs across the corporate world. And on a whim, I sent an email to somebody named Guy Kawasaki. Anybody knows Guy? Original evangelist from Apple, currently the chief evangelist for Canva. I did not know Guy. Uh, for the six months that I had been writing my blog, Escape from Cubicle Nation, I had about three readers, my dad, my sister, and my best friend, <laughs> and a random person from Google. So I sent an email on a whim to Guy, not knowing him, and 10 minutes later, he emailed me back and said, I love it. So I screamed. The next day, he published my blog post on his blog. And I went from my dad, my sister, and my best friend 
to tens of thousands of readers all around the world. Thank you, Guy Kawasaki. Oh, always so appreciative of that. And so it was this experience of connection that eventually had my publisher, Penguin Portfolio, reach out to do a book. And lo and behold, Guy wrote the foreword to Escape from Cubicle Nation, which came out in 2009. Fast forward to 2021. <laughs> where we have the great resignation, and I'm sitting there watching on television like, why is this happening? How is it happening? Why are people leaving? To which, I, here's a quote from one of my original posts in 2006. I had to hold myself back from tweeting all in caps, like, I told you so in 2006. We've seen this. Those of you who have been inside companies, it's not a surprise for the trends that were happening. But what we learned is, if given the opportunity employees will leave leaders if there's something that's more valuable. So this began to really start this exploration of saying, working with many, many different employees and, and who were leaving to start businesses, beginning to work with people on their marketing plans. In the entrepreneur space, I saw a lot of language about empires. So people would actually use language like, build your empire, Let's crush your competitors. Let's hustle our way to the top of the hill. It is very empire-based language. And I'm not really a fan of empires. They've generally been very good for a few people at the top, not so good for everybody else. But I was noticing that it was also not accurately reflecting the reality of anybody I have ever worked with. First of all, nobody ever does anything alone. And if they tell you so, they're probably not being totally truthful. And any client I had ever worked with always needed more than just me in order to do what they needed to do. They work with other service providers, they use products, they had lawyers, they had accountants. And so I began to get really fascinated by this idea of ecosystem marketing, really looking at partnerships that small business owners could begin to, to create. And for some, uh, in some of the spaces where I was, I was at South by Southwest in 2009, and I was hanging out in the hallway with Sunir Shah, and if Sunir is here, Holler, raise your hand in the very back. So I was hanging out in this historical moment now where Sunir was talking with folks from MailChimp and Batch Books and Shoebox, Outright. Did I miss anybody? OK. So we were literally hanging in the hallway, much like probably all of you are doing here. And Sunir, who says he's like the only marketer in the group, was like, you know what? We share the same customers. We should maybe like do some marketing together. They were like, yeah, that's, that's actually kind of a good idea. And so from that first meeting in the hallway at South by Southwest was born the Small Business Web, which then became the Cloud Software Association, which I saw as of today's website has 4,000 members, <laughs> all starting with this idea of ecosystems. So I just knew there was something happening within the SaaS space where you all got it, you understood what was happening. So I just dove deep on my side in the small business market. And um, 2015, I did a 23 city tour, testing a model about ecosystems with small business owners. I had, I had visited and other book tours. Uh, we did a 2,000 person survey with 100 different partners who were sharing. Also the Cloud Software Association, thanks Sunir. Gathering data about what products were people using, what other service providers were they using. And then my husband and I opened a small business learning lab in our downtown Mesa, Arizona, as a way to really study real time ecosystem building in a live downtown arena. So I was going head first, and it really made sense. The model was shaping up as I was writing the book. But then one day I got an email from my friend Sean Blanda, and he was no longer at Behance and Adobe, where I'd known him from before, and he was from this company called Crossbeam. And so I was curious, opened up the email, and I went to the website. Now, I don't know if any of you are C.S. Lewis fans. Yes, C.S. Lewis, Narnia, OK. I felt like I was Lucy <laughs> going through the wardrobe into the land of Narnia. It was like, ecosystems are everything. There was beautifully designed content about partnerships. There was data and modeling. It just was the piece for me that felt like it was totally missing from what it is that I had been so interested in and seeing. And with that kind of inspiration, I felt like there was a piece of the model that was finally making sense, even knowing that for our small business market, we are in no way as, 
as far along as you are to actually activating, especially using data and technology, the kind of partnerships. Uh, I interviewed Bob for the book, and he shared a story which has been immortalized in the Crossbeam blog, which is, as he called it, his $2.6 billion lesson, <laughs> his old company, RJ Metrics, which he sold you know, for a handsome um, amount of money, but he said his competitor, Looker, sold their company to Google for $2.6 billion. And Bob said one of my favorite quotes. He said, we built a company before where data went to die, and I will never do that again. Ecosystems are everything. So there are specific ways that I want you to maybe think of on a deeper level for the kind of skills you have as individuals, the kinds of gifts that you have for partnership that can maybe go above and beyond only thinking about the kind of change that you can make within companies. And so one area I invite you to think about for those of you who have this connection is community repair. Basically, we are a wreck, <laughs> like in every single social contract. And we can't talk to each other about politics, the environment, the supply chain, the economy, their mental health. We are so fragmented right now. And I think one of the things that we need are people like yourselves who have the skills to have deep listening, empathy, long-term perspective, the ability to be designing solutions that actually take into account the well-being of everyone. And these kinds of skills, for those of you who might be called to that, are so vitally needed within our communities. There's another area that I think definitely harkens back to everything that I saw in the early days of Escape from Cubicle Nation that I still find today with a great resignation. And that is really looking more at a model of leadership as partnership. A lot of the skills that you have for understanding how to cultivate partners, how to get to know people, how to understand individual motivations, design things that can be a little bit bespoke in terms of what different people need are the same things that can allow you to be really great leaders. So I encourage you to go for those leadership roles if you're called for it. I think you're naturally gifted in the kind of leadership that's going to keep people at companies. And I have kind of an unlikely example. My son Josh is 17, and he just started his first job at a restaurant called the Buffalo Spot. So Buffalo is in sauce, not as in meat, although Buffalo meat's good too. But, but he, at this restaurant, he works for the owner whose name is Pedro Ortiz. Any of you have teenagers at home like I do? Okay. So teenagers probably are known as like some of the most tricky demographic. Like if you gave birth to them, if, if you're their parents, often they will still stay in the room for two days and not talk to you. So a lot of people who are trying to hire teenagers these days say they're having a huge problem with attraction, with people, you know, with turnover. Pedro at the Buffalo spot has no turnover. When kids leave high school, they go to college. When they come back for vacation, they fight over a spot in the schedule to be able to come back and work there. So my son, after working there about two months, came over and he said, I said, how was work? And he goes, it was great. He goes, you know what, mom? I would work there for free. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, is this like a job you're supposed to get paid for? And I was like, why? And he's like, I would totally do it for Pedro. And I was like, OK, can you tell me? I've like studied leadership for most of my professional career. Tell me about what Pedro does that's so amazing. And he said, well, all right, it's super easy to schedule because we have an app. So I always know when I'm working, if I want to put in or trade with somebody, it's super easy to do. I have direct deposit. It's really easy. He trained us really well, so I know what to do. And every time we go into work, it's really clear exactly what needs to get done. He's like, so Pedro checks in with us. He makes sure we have exactly what we need in order to get work done. And sometimes he hangs out, sometimes he leaves. He said, but there's this thing that occasionally Pedro comes back and he brings a polo shirt. And somebody, if they've done a really good job, gets a polo shirt and a dollar an hour raise. And I was like, so what do you have to do to get the polo shirt? And he was like, I don't know. <laughs> but then he said, I don't care. I trust Pedro. So be like Pedro. 
That is my best advice, all right? Um, the last, I will say plea. <laughs> we were just talking backstage about how wonderful it is. It's nourishing, it's Narnia. It is so beautiful to be in a room full of people who don't question every assumption about why ecosystems instead of empires, where you're valuing the human side of the equation as opposed to only looking at the bottom line. It's so nourishing to have that. And for I'm sure many of you who are in the room, including the founders of Crossbeam, who have been through that struggle for a long time, it is so good that more and more people are beginning to talk that way and think that way. I have a very strong point of view about small business, that that is the future for small business owners. I know it's difficult when you're on the product side to like figure us out. There's so much diversity in different types of businesses. But a lot of what we've seen downtown Mesa is that it really is the future in terms of how it is that we can all work together. During COVID, we had absolute unity downtown. We didn't lose one business because everybody was working together, sometimes standing 20 feet apart with huge masks before any of the vaccines were available, helping people to fill out the applications for how to get their you know, PPP loans or that kind of thing. Everybody absolutely really hung together and it's made our downtown continue, a continued really vibrant area. So there are ways in which we can be teaching about ecosystems, talking about ecosystems, proudly extolling the virtues of working together that I think is something that we all need to hear and that we can really all have um, a place in. <sighs> Thinking about each of you individually, I imagine in the world that you're in, in the tech world, no, seeing all the crash of stocks and having some uncertainty, having been in this work for 26 years, seeing so many different dips, I will tell you the one thing that I really believe in. And the thing that I believe in is an individual's ability to be excellent at what they do, to be creating a really solid body of work, to be sharing that body of work, and to make sure that you are a very strong partner within the ecosystem. When uh, that same South by Southwest in 2009, I was on a panel with Guy Kawasaki about blog to book, like we did with Escape from Cubicle Nation. And somebody in the audience said, Guy, you know, how do you attract the attention of really busy influencers? And he said, sometimes people think I might have the Midas touch, that everything I touch turns to gold. He said, they have it wrong. I only touch gold. You're the gold. The work you do, the focus you put on your undeveloping and growing your skills, the way that you share your body of work, the way you let people know your perspective, your point of view, for every single one of you that is so important in your representation of your companies and also in the representation of the way that people know you. The way I get to know people is I Google them. <laughs> and the breadcrumb that comes, the trail of information, is really the way that we can get to know each other. To me, that's the only security that we really have and the strength that we each have. So believe it and act on it. It is so wonderful to be in a place where with certainty, we can know that ecosystems really are the future. We can say Bob Moore said it, Sarah Wang said it, <laughs> so many of the other speakers said it. I think unequivocally, it is really the area in which we can feel strength, in which we can feel that partnership with each other. And I think it really is, for those of you who are in this profession, the way that you can feel pride, the way that you can really step up in your role. Um, and I'm waiting for the moment, maybe with that most cynical, whoever's your arch nemesis, the one who's like been <sighs> partnerships and ecosystems, whatever, I guarantee you, five or 10 years down the road, they'll, they'll show up like, I have this great idea for sales. Like, here's this book about ecosystems and partnerships. And at that point, you can either say something quietly or you can shout on caps on Twitter, I told you so in 2022 at Supernode. This is the future and you're in the right place. If you're ever in Mesa, Arizona, we invite you to come down to the Main Street Learning Lab. We have a huge whiteboard wall where you can nerd out about ecosystems. We will cry with joy with you when you get so happy that your partners are making sales. And we just really want to reinforce for you that you are in a transformational profession. And if you're acting upon these skills, I really think you're positioned to secure 
our future. Thank you so much. Have safe travels home, and it was a delight. <laughs>